Hey, KU fans, welcome back to KU Sports Extra. And we're talking extra because it's extra content, it's extra analysis. Triple extra. That's what I was going to say. It's not extra. Extra, overtimes. extra, extra. Right. What a special game. That's where we're going to jump right into it. And usually we look ahead, but there's no way. We have to look back. KU Oklahoma, three overtimes, 109, 106 Kansas. That's the good news this week and pretty much every week for the rest of time because that game is one for the ages, was one for the ages, and, and it'll be talked about for decades. What's your favorite part of that game? My favorite part of the game was the Frank Mason play. Uh, that was just so cagey on his part. It was probably an illegal play, but not the kind of play that necessarily gets called. Well, and it wasn't because – go ahead and explain how Frank – you know, kind well, of uh, explained how it wasn't illegal. It well, was a really s- just sharp explanation. I well, think. the ref told Frank, "You got to move back a step," and so Frank said that as soon as the ref handed the ball to Buddy Heald, that Frank moved forward because once that Buddy had the ball, there was nothing the ref could. There do. was nothing he could do. So <laughs> Best I think explanation ever. You know, Frank has got to brush up on the rules, but it's a good thing he didn't because he made the play and got away with it. And there were a number of shaky calls throughout that game, as you pointed in your day after blog, in both directions. But, right, right. But just a super play, first of all, to bat it. Second of all, to run it down and then to have a couple of dribble moves to where he didn't either get it stolen or charge or anything and broke free and they had no choice but to foul him. And just a really great play, but Jamari Trailer's two uh, block oh, shots man. were terrific as very, well. Very, Just impressive. amazing. Yeah, it was a great game. I think the best thing, you know, a lot of people talk about great games, right? And they, they say that the KU-Missouri game was a great game. And, and obviously yeah. it was a great finish. It was a great comeback. But KU played lousy for three quarters of that game, and, and, and Missouri was putting it on him. So for me, and this is maybe just a personal preference, but for me, a great game has to be more than just a great comeback. To qualify as a great game, I think it has to be well played at a high level. Uh, and, and this game was that from really start to finish. These two teams were incredible. I, I'd watch that again and again and again. Uh, and, and as far as Buddy Heald, I, I would pay admission to watch that guy play He's pretty much amazing. anything. Yeah. yeah, and you know, what was cool about the game is uh, for most of it, there were so many guarded shots that were hit. Right. The offense was incredible. The shot making was just incredible. And then when their legs are shot, they still mustered up the energy to play great defense. When guys on both sides are chucking up air balls, Part of the reason is great defense was played. I mean, Perry Ellis with a great block shot right. of Spangler on that final possession. Uh, and then great D played on Buddy Heald there in the final possession. It was uh, really just a, such a cool game, and the teams are very, very even and similar. Yeah, There's very similar. no big man you can dump it down to who's a, a big guy who's a low post scorer. Right. But Ellis and Spangler both can get stuff done near the hoop. Latin's a good defensive big guy. And then KU, uh, uh, KU's rotation of big men, different guy every night. This time it was Trailer who played the good defense down low. Other times it's Mickelson. and Lucas maybe, rebounding the ball. Yeah, Lucas yeah. rebounding. He made a number of great plays. Maybe eventually Sheck Diallo will, will join the party. But clearly this was no game for raw freshmen right. like Sheck Diallo. Right, and, and very similar in this aspect too. Full of upperclassmen, and I love yes. that. You don't see that in college basketball as much anymore, and I think that's what makes Oklahoma and Kansas unique this year, and I think that's what gives them a real shot to, to obviously both end up at the Final Four if, if the bracket falls that way. They're fantastically talented teams. Uh, you said the fatigue, the, the effort, the fact that everybody was spent after that one when Jordan Woodard fouled out. It took him like 15 minutes to get off the floor. His legs were just cramping. Yeah. He couldn't move. I mean, uh, and, and that was because he knew he didn't play. He couldn't play anymore. If he hadn't fouled and he still had four and he was on the floor, he would have sprinted and dove and, and made you, a three. And he I mean, caught fire at the end of the first half and he never cooled off. Right. He didn't do much until that point, and then he just caught fire. And man, was he a force! Yeah, 27 points for him. 27 points for Perry Ellis. 46 for Buddy Heald. Uh, and only 23 shots yeah, from the amazing. field. Amazing. Just amazing. Good news because we'll be talking about it forever. Uh, where does it rank for you? I know that, that KU Volleyball's win in San Diego was number one for that you. That was the number one comeback. Right. Oh, yeah. comeback. That's what yep. it was. Yeah. So. so I'll call this the number one uh, uh, game, I guess. Yeah? Best one yeah. you've seen? I can't think of another. You know, I mean, 
That Missouri game was great. Kirk Gibson's home right. run was a great comeback and a great game. It had so many cool features to it. Canseco hit a grand slam. Sure. Um, but this was just, I don't know, maybe it's because the most recent, but how do you get a better game? Yeah, I think a lot of people are throwing that around. Greatest game in Allen Fieldhouse history, all this stuff, and I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's going too far. I think it's, no. at the very least, in the conversation. What's the bad news this week? And I know it can't be KUOU because there's just nothing but good all no, the way there. Nothing, uh, bad, no bad news with the basketball team. Certainly, right. they had a couple of tough games coming up, but certainly they're playing great. Uh, that was a great team they beat the other night. The bad news is that the Kansas football team has lost its first assistant coach, Kevin Kane, a former Jayhawk who had that memorable interception and return against Nebraska. Uh, in the 40 to 14 or 41 14, I forget the exact score, but that was the, the turning point for KU football under Mangino, that game to me. Uh, but uh, he is going to Northern Illinois, received a promotion as a defensive coordinator, which leaves a void not only as a coach, which he's a good young coach at the age of 31, but just as important as a recruiter, particularly in the Kansas City metro area. He had some good ties there and was establishing some good ties where uh, on the Missouri side, Kansas has not done well of late, and he was hoped that they would. So that's a loss. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Clint Bowen's from the area. He can pick up some, some of the slack there. David Beatty is everywhere uh, all the time, so he should also be able to do that. And I think Gene Weir, this may be an opportunity. He can't go out and recruit and all that. But, you know, his ties, his connections, knowing guys, knowing coaches, that could help too uh, in that regard. And then it remains to be seen who they hire to replace him. Uh, I would think that will be important. But, um, you know, they're going to go after the guy that helps the program the most. If that's another guy that can recruit Texas, they'll probably do it, um, which they did add Jason Phillips. To, to coach wide receivers with Clint Kubiak, and, and that was the sole reason for that. I mean, he knows the air raid offense, but he's a big-time recruiter down there in Houston and a little bit in Dallas, too. So, again, if they can find a guy that can recruit anywhere well, they'll probably go with him. It doesn't have to be Kansas City because those other guys can kind of fill in. But just look what he did with Joe Deneen this year, Kevin Kane. I yep. mean, he, the, Joe Deneen gets a lot of the credit for that, but Joe Deneen started the season a little bit lost. He's playing linebacker for the first time. And I think that his development shows you what, what kind of a, a quality coach Kevin Kane is. Uh, he helped Deneen understand the position because he had played it himself. And then he helped the kid develop and, and just turn into really a force by the end of the year. So that one guy, I know it's just one guy, but I think that tells you what kind of coach Kevin Kane yep. is. I think he'll Kane's do on the fast track here. Yeah. His career is yeah. on the fast track. A D coordinator at the age of 31, that's pretty darn good. Awesome. Going back to North, uh, in Northern Illinois where he coached uh, before and did some great recruiting work and coaching work there, obviously, because the coach is bringing him back yeah. after losing his D coordinator to Rutgers. Yeah, good stuff. Bad news for KU, but good news for a good guy, for sure. And I don't think, uh, it, you know, who knows what the path is, but uh, something tells me it might not be the last time we see him at Kansas. Uh, yeah, you know, I Down mean, the, road. the guy uh, obviously is a good coach and has fond feelings of Kansas, and he got a promotion. You can't bag him on him for taking a job where he got a promotion. No doubt. All right, well, KU basketball heads out on the road for a couple of games, Texas Tech on Saturday and then at West Virginia. You know, two tough games, really. Uh, Texas Tech, I think, is much better than people are accustomed to them being over the past couple of years, and, and then West Virginia is always tough, yeah. uh, especially there. So uh, you'll be down in Lubbock Saturday. I'll be in Morgantown Tuesday. What do you think about this stretch? How important is it for Kansas, especially coming off that triple overtime uh, victory against, you know, obviously their toughest challenger for that Big 12 title? Well, if they were to sweep these two games, right. that would be really, really impressive. I mean, that's, a, you know, on the road. Uh, Tubby Smith is an excellent basketball coach, obviously. Uh, right. Gave Kansas a real tough game last right, year. Right, right. I mean, they almost lost down there last year. They looked to be a little bit better this year. So, hey, that's a, a tough game. and They've already knocked off Texas. And, yeah. and, you know, Texas is going through some transition themselves. Without but, Cam Ridley also, that's a tough loss for Texas. Right, right. But, yeah, Tech I don't think is anybody you can take lightly. And then West Virginia, just nasty. I mean, yeah. that, that, that game there will be maybe not quite as well played or as highly – competitive as this one was but but that's how West Virginia plays too so physical so tenacious so nasty and, and KU usually has it 
has had to match that to try to hang in there. There was a game, was it last year or two years ago, when KU was down big to West Virginia at the field house and had to fight and claw to get back and, and, and won that right. game. And then there was a game, I think that was last year. I, I think, think so too, yeah. They run together. But then there was a game a couple of years ago where Wiggins uh, was played the role of Buddy Hill, oh, right. scoring 40-plus right. and in a loss. for the losing side. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so – Big stretch for KU. Everybody else in this league already has taken a loss. I mean, not everybody, obviously, but Baylor's lost a game. Oklahoma's now lost a game. Iowa State's lost a game. Texas has lost a game. The, the top challengers certainly ha have already taken a loss. If KU can get out to 4 0 with a couple of road wins, wow. Yeah, uh, that would be. You, you can never call it in this league because it's way too <laughs> early, but it obviously would set the path right for KU to. To be well on its way to number 12. And, and it would and, bum out the rest of the teams. Yeah, it would. It would. And, and Oklahoma so was so close. A free throw away from really making this thing interesting. That guy, Latin made it his free throw. At the end of regulation, and, and they leave with a victory. You never know. 78-77 it would have been, I think. Uh, and, and then it goes yes. to 109-106. Amazing. Yep. So if you, made, if you made the first one. But anyway, um, let's, let's jump right into that. Prediction time. I, you can tell me if you want, if KU is going to sweep these two or, or win or not. But more than anything, I want to talk about the race. Uh, what do you, how do you see this thing shaping up now that we've seen a few games? And, and obviously, we've got a real close look at Oklahoma, who I think nobody can argue that they're the top contender to knock Kansas well, off. Well, big win for Oklahoma to start the conference off. Yeah. Yes, it was at home, but it was against Iowa State. And Iowa State is the team you think of that comes to mind first when you think of who's the third best team in this right, conference. Right. So Oklahoma's off to a good start. Definitely. They did what they had to do, uh, which was beat a good uh, Iowa State team, and they lost to KU, but certainly did it in a fashion where you believe that they could very easily even that series this year right, when right. Kansas returns there. And I tweeted before the game that it was the first time I could ever remember looking forward to the rematch before the first wow. game tipped off. Well, little did I know how much I'm now looking forward to the rematch. No kidding. Everybody talks about they could possibly play three more times in Norman, in the Big 12 tournament, and in and the, then national, the national championship game. game. But <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, I would sign up for that right now. I'd love to see that team, that, those teams battle three yeah, more times. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be really cool. You know, the cliche has become, well, this is such a tough conference. It's going to take this many losses, and everybody's going to have this many losses. And I think this many losses or this many wins could still win the league. What, what do you think? I, I, I kind of tend to believe maybe two losses because I do think Kansas and Oklahoma are so far ahead of the rest of these guys. I, I think Nas Long, the loss of him for Iowa State to injury really hurts them. If not for that, I'd put them right in that same breath. But, I, but I mean, you know, you, you, you think that. Uh, sure, they're better than everyone else. But look, Oklahoma struggled to beat Iowa State in right, Norman. Right. And Kansas is going to Lubbock and Morgantown, West Virginia. Now, yeah. if they win both of those games, then your statement sure. is it's true. But think about how hard that is to pull off that sweep. You go down to Lubbock, you beat a, a decent Texas Tech team that is very well coached. They're playing in Lubbock, and then you turn around and fly to Morgantown, right. West Virginia. Right. You twiddle your thumbs for a couple of days in Morgantown. Maybe you eat at the Big Biscuit. Maybe you don't. But Biscuit World. <laughs> Biscuit World. Biscuit World. The Big That's Biscuit's right. right here in Lawrence. That's and, right. Biscuit World. Yeah, Biscuit World. Good spot. I, I'm looking forward to that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's in a vacuum or in a, in a you know, perfect world, a perfect environment, you could just say, well, if Kansas plays to that level and Oklahoma plays to that level every night against every opponent, then maybe they could get by with two losses. But that's but not the way it works. probably not going to do it, right? Yeah, these are experienced teams and more consistent than other teams because experienced teams are consistent, but they're still 21, 22 years old. Yeah. Uh, you've never raised children, but I've raised four of them. And, there you, you know, go. Yeah, by the time they get to 25, they're consistent. There you go. Good to know. And how many of yours are there? Three? Uh, three. Okay. Although the youngest has always been pretty consistent. <laughs> Good point. All right, well, primetime pick. Um, KU's obviously got a bunch of guys playing at a very high level right now. Who do you think plays well? and kind of sets himself apart in these next two games for Kansas? Or who, or who do you think needs to play well? Well, I, I think Perry also play well. He had that unbelievable flurry in, in the first half in a two-and-a-half-minute stretch where he scored nine points and did it in so many different ways right. and set up Bragg for a bucket. He's just so quick. He's got a good handle, and he's got a good shot, and I think he'll shoot better closer to the hoop 
he was dropping a hook shots over the seven footer. So uh, I, I just think Perry Ellis, as well as he played, I think he's going to play even better because more of his shots are going to start dropping. I like it. I'm looking forward to seeing if Brandon Green gets back to just being a sharpshooter. He's really looked to emphasize driving. And, and putting the ball on the deck and trying to get to the rim or trying to create. And I think that's a good thing for him. I think it helps develop his game, and I think it helps the team and the offense. But what he does best is shoot three-pointers, and everybody right. knows that. And he hasn't been taking the volume that probably most would like to see in the last few games, and I think that changes in these road games. He's the kind of guy that gets up for these challenges, likes to shut up the other crowd with a big three-pointer, and then whatever he does with his, you know, I don't know what that is, but sometimes it looks all right. I saw Devontae Graham's doing it now after he does this. It's, you know, hey. That was invented by the Marquette players. Yeah? Yeah. Speaking of Marquette, (laughs) anyway, I've got Brandon Green having two really good games, shooting the ball, high percentage from behind the arc. I I think he's, uh, he's ready to get back on track as far as just knocking down those shots and hopefully that doesn't mean that he stops driving because that's something that that really helps this team and they benefit from if he can kind of blend the two it'd be it'd be a huge lift for Kansas but he's looked great since he's come back from his suspension yeah he he looks like his efforts really there he still spaces out a little bit on defense yeah. but he's he bring he's bringing a lot of effort and uh he's good talent yeah and he's gonna help him you can see he's he cares now. and he's, he's clearly their sixth man right right you know he's the first guy they go to on the bench with good reason Right. All right. Well, let's finish it off. As always, the most obnoxious man in sports this week. Or these past couple of weeks since the holidays hit and we had to kind of take a couple of breaks here. But happy holidays, by the way. Who's your most obnoxious man? I'm going to go Charlie Sly. Uh, Charlie Sly is the guy who on Hidden Camera talked (laughs) about HGH in relation to Peyton Manning. And then, uh, day before the documentary comes out, he reads from a statement prepared to him by someone's lawyers uh, saying that he made the whole thing up. Well, Charlie, if you'd have kept your mouth shut in the first place, maybe you wouldn't have had to read some statement saying you made the whole thing up. So either you were lying the first time to make yourself look like a big shot in the know, or you're lying the second time because you're really, really scared. <laughs> Either way, you're obnoxious. Perfect. I like the segue because speaking of making things up, Johnny Manziel, our poster boy for most obnoxious man in sports, uh, and rightly the icon. so, yeah, he made himself up at a Vegas nightclub wearing a wig, a fake mustache, glasses, introducing himself to people as Billy. Uh, this guy, man, he just does not get it. And I guess at the end of the night when his, it was time to settle the bill, he asked for it to be comped because he didn't bring any cash and he didn't want to use his card, probably because he didn't want to out himself as not Billy. I mean, you know, that's, a, that's a, a pretty sweet disguise there. You don't want people to know you're not Billy. And he didn't anticipate that there would be a settle-up point. Right, no. He just wanted it to be comped because he's That's the guy I deal. want running my office. No kidding. That's part of it. The other part of it is that he skipped a concussion protocol at the team facility. Uh, that's mandatory, by the way. Uh, but he decided to either sleep through it or skip it or whatever. Uh, it sounds like Cleveland is, quote, so done with him. And I think the NFL should be so done with him. Which brings me to my runner-up, Jerry Jones. Because it sounds like Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, is hinting in so many words that he'd be interested in adding you know, a playmaker as a backup on his roster. Obviously, Jerry Jones wants the circus. He wants to sell tickets, and Johnny Manziel would be perfect there for that reason. But he stinks as a quarterback. A shame on the Browns for thinking he was a first-round draft choice. Joke. Absolute joke. If Chiefs fans are watching this, you can remember the play that set me off more than I've been set off all year. Johnny Manziel being harassed all afternoon by the Kansas City defense is falling down facing away from the line of scrimmage, nearly knee touching the ground, and he flips it to the right tackle. Now credit the right tackle for catching it, because what else is he gonna do? And then just taking a knee. I mean, he was just like basically saying, I'm over, enough is enough. I think we should all be done with Johnny Manziel, the experiment too. He should go play arena league, sell a bunch of tickets there, and then go to Vegas whenever he wants, it's enough. Yeah, but the disguise was just so crafty and the, the planning. That was just such a well-planned yeah, yeah. ruse. Obnoxious move, but really sharp on the planning there. All right, that's all the time we have for this episode of KU Sports Extra. The KU Oklahoma... 
homage, the celebration of greatness, whatever you want to call it, the, the Tom Keegan hour, whatever you want to call the it. I hope it overtime. wasn't an hour, uh, but it was extra, 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 and it was extra fun. Uh, let's see what the rest of the season brings. We'll be here next week with another episode. We'll talk to you guys then. Thanks for checking out this episode.